time and get the story of how we came to that moment as a country. What you're looking at is the morning of May the 3rd, 1971. The place, of course, National Mall and the Washington Monument. These are Army helicopters dropping off soldiers from the 82nd Airborne Division. They were among 10,000 active duty troops rushed to DC at the orders of President Richard Nixon. And not far away at this time, tens of thousands of anti-war protesters were amassing. As you'll see soon, this had already been an incredibly busy season of protest in the nation's capital. And now a group calling itself the May Day Tribe was carrying out the boldest mass action of the movement yet, a blockade of the streets and bridges and buildings of Washington. It was the biggest act of civil disobedience the country had ever seen. And their slogan, as many of you may know, was this, if the government won't stop the war, we'll stop the government. Now, this was happening at a time when Richard Nixon was in some political peril. His reelection campaign was about to begin. His approval ratings were the lowest of his first term. And the last thing he wanted was a successful shutdown of the city. So that's how we ended up with the scene on the mall. The military called in against peaceful protesters, against peaceful civilians. It looks like a picture from a country in serious trouble. Okay, so how do we get there? The anti-war movement really began in 1965, right after Lyndon Johnson said, sent the Marines to Vietnam. Very brief history here. The Americans essentially replaced the French who had colonized Indochina in the late 19th century. The French were driven out by the Vietnamese independence movement and the Americans moved in. And we were deep in the Cold War against the Soviets and the Chinese. And the idea was to contain the spread of communism. But I think most historians now agree there was no legitimate strategic reason for us to be there, to be waging a war against a country of peasants. There was no threat to our homeland. And certainly many people then and now saw the war as not only fruitless, but immoral. So the growing anti-war movement was the main reason that Johnson didn't run for another term. Nixon squeaked by in 1968, barely, and the anti-war protests kept growing. Nixon had a much more visceral dislike of the left and especially protesters than Johnson. So the bigger the movement, the more it stoked his dark side, his paranoia. What you're seeing here is the march in 1969 that was called the moratorium. Hundreds of thousands of people came to Washington to protest the war. There were similar marches the same day around the country. You see that ring of buses? That's a ring of buses around the White House. I want you to remember those buses as we go to the next slide. By the way, this quote is from Nixon. You know, hundreds of thousands of people outside, under no circumstances will I be affected, whatever. Um, maybe sounds familiar. You'll hear a lot of familiar things in this, in this talk. When Nixon took office, he brought in his trusted cronies like John Mitchell as attorney general, the guy on the right with the pipe. He also recruited a lot of young guys. And yeah, almost all of them were guys. One of them was a lawyer from Seattle named Eagle Krogh, who was known as Bud. On the left, Bud wasn't long out of law school when he came to the White House and he got stuck with some of the most vexing domestic issues on Nixon's agenda, including how to deal with anti-war protests. Bud's a prominent character in the book because you can see through his eyes how Nixon's confrontation with the movement really sowed the seeds of Nixon's downfall. Those buses around the White House, that was Bud's idea. You know those John Wayne cowboy movies when the settlers circle the wagons? That's where Bud got inspired. Uh, and Bud was there one night when Nixon's response to the protesters turned really weird. You may have heard this story, it's an amazing one. This was in May of 1970, a year before the main events in my book. Uh, it was right when Nixon launched his first geographic expansion of the war into Cambodia. And that set off nationwide protests and strikes, hundreds of college campuses. One of the campuses was in Ohio at Kent State University. And that was when the National Guard began firing on a group of students and four kids were killed. So all the movement organizations instantly declared a major protest in DC for that weekend. The whole thing was putting Nixon under this incredible pressure. He's 
drinking late at night. He's watching the movie Patton over and over again for inspiration, I guess. And the night before the demonstration, this is a Friday night, he can't sleep. He's up in the middle of the night, looking out his window, he can see the demonstrators gathering on the mall. So he gets this idea that he could sneak out of the White House at three or four in the morning to explain himself to these kids. These kids who were pouring in from all over the country, furious about the Kent State killings and about Cambodia. He, didn't, he said, don't tell anybody. You know, he only brought his personal valet and his, the White House doctor with him. Not really sure why the doc is there. But anyway, Nixon calls for a car and a few Secret Service agents managed to get into the limo. And now there's one White House guy on duty that overnight. It's Bud Krog. He's up, he's checking the buses, making sure there are no gaps anywhere in the cordon. He suddenly hears a Secret Service going nuts. Nixon's code name for the Secret Service is Searchlight. And it comes over the speaker where Bud is standing. Searchlight is on the lawn. And Bud races down in time just to see the taillights of Nixon's limo disappear through the gate. Holy crap. So Bud commandeers a car and a driver himself, and he follows the limo to the Lincoln Memorial. And when Bud gets there, he sees something like this. The Lincoln Memorial is full of young people. Some are sleeping, some are stoned, maybe a lot are stoned. By the way, kids, pot used to be illegal in this country. And here's this president suddenly standing there inches from them. Nixon launches into this monologue for half an hour or so until the sun starts to rise. And, you know, look, Nixon, it must be said, is trying really hard to connect in his way, but it's, it's hopeless really, right? The kids are full of disdain. And when they get asked by reporters later what happened, they make it very clear how disdainful they are. And these news reports, they just send Nixon into even more of a funk in a bad place when it comes to the protests. So I think this was really a, an inflection point for Nixon. So now we're heading into the spring of 1971. Nixon has expanded the war again, this time into Laos, and the anti-war movement flames on again. The movements made up always has been of a lot of different groups with different agendas, but they all start to work together. They make plans for what they call the spring offensive, this is the series of demonstrations over a period of weeks that will end with the May Day blockade. One of the most radical splinter groups in the left is the Weather Underground. And starting in the fall of 69, this group had set bombs in places like police cars, banks, and courthouses. Their general idea was that such attacks would help spark a revolution in America. It didn't spark a revolution, but it did spark a frantic government manhunt. And the FBI and other agencies were so desperate to catch these folks that they vastly expanded their illegal surveillance and infiltration of the wider anti-war movement. What you're seeing here is the inside of the US Capitol on the morning of March 1st, 1971. It, it was really the unofficial kickoff of the spring offensive. The Weather Underground put a bomb in an unmarked bathroom and it blew just after midnight. No one was hurt, but the damage was extensive. And this quote here is from Nixon that came the next day. Uh, it just shows how worried the White House was about the attacks and no doubt this influenced Nixon's reaction to May Day. The FBI and the Justice Department stepped up their activities after the bombing. They couldn't find the weather underground. The cells were just too good at keeping themselves hidden in secret. So they tried to get at them by issuing grand jury subpoenas to other activists. And here are three of the original yippies. From the left, it's Jerry Rubin and Judy Gumbo and Stu Albert. They too are characters in the book. At one point they called a press conference in front of the Capitol to deny any involvement in the bombing. And the great quote is from Judy. We didn't do it, but we dug it. It gives you a sense of the sort of attitude of the left at the time. Okay, so back to the protests of spring. The first group in town was the Vietnam Veterans Against the War. They've been active for a while, but this was really their first coming out. More than a thousand of them came to DC to declare their opposition to the war that they'd been waging. And to my knowledge, that's the only time that's happened in America while a war is going on. They were getting a lot of flack from the Nixon administration, which understood really well how this kind of demonstration kind of undermined 
the argument that anyone who was against the war was unpatriotic. The vets wanted to camp on the National Mall right near the Capitol, and the administration went to court to kick them off. And the government actually won that case, but the vets refused to go. And the government backed down. It was a huge victory for the vets and a huge victory for the movement. And just that started to really move public opinion even more against the war. The White House is tracking these, you know, public opinion through these internal polls all the time. And that's what they found out. So, so the vets came to town and two events followed that really captured people's emotions and scared the White House even more. The first was the testimony at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee by the spokesman for the Vietnam vets. And of course, this is John Kerry, future Senator and Secretary of State. He made a long statement at the hearing. It was really a powerful piece of speech making, full of detail, careful argument about the disaster that the war had become and the need for the country to end it and heal. He got a huge amount of news coverage bursting onto the national scene really for the first time. His famous quote here, how do you ask a man to be the last man to die from a mistake? That just echoed through Washington and the country. And here was a second emotional moment it happened the next day. The vets marched to the Capitol and they hurled their medals and their ribbons over a fence and onto the steps of the Capitol. It was this powerful demonstration of defiance and anger and sorrow. I don't think we've seen anything like it before or since. The White House was getting more and more worried about the spring offensive um, after this. The, the next thing that, the next event that followed the vets in town was this huge mass march, sort of more traditional march, but this time it had a huge amount of support from uh, not just the anti-war, the classic anti-war movement, but liberal groups and everybody else around the country. So it was, I think by all standards, probably the biggest march that had ever been in Washington up until that point. Most of the anti-war groups were there peace groups, labor groups, you name it. There were probably 400,000 people. The buses coming in were backed up on the, on the turnpike practically to Baltimore. Um, here's just part of how big and varied the march turned out to be. You can see, I mean, you had people ranging from Maoists, you know, to the Rotary Club. Um, the, the public opinion about the war was really demonstrably huge by then. The march ended at the Capitol for a rally. And there were lots of speeches, including one from John Kerry and music, of course. And that's something that's really easy to forget about this movement. It was a cultural as well as a political movement. There was a real kind of joyful vibe in addition to the anger about the war. Um, something that you wonder if, if it might be missing in some of the present day protests. So there was always music involved. You hear the folk group, Peter, Paul and Mary with John Denver singing along with them. I don't know, maybe somebody knows what they were, which song they were singing together. I, I couldn't figure that out. So when the big march left town, the more militant members of the movement were the ones who stayed, sort of getting ready for the May Day blockade. And they, did, they didn't just wait around. They had a lot of actions planned throughout that week or so. Uh, they tried to hit one federal agency each day to protest outside or inside the buildings. Here is the Selective Service, which is the agency that ran the military draft, which had conscripted hundreds of thousands of young men to Vietnam. The police had to literally drag the workers over the crowd to get them inside. There were other actions at the Capitol, a justice in front of the White House. One group even went out to the, they figured out where the Secretary of Defense, Melvin Laird, lived in the suburbs. And they went out to his house and they hung the Viet Cong flag on his porch. Um, so everybody's kind of getting ready now for the big blockade. And among the leaders of the May Day plan were Rennie Davis here on the right and David Dellinger in the Russian hat sort of on the left. Rennie was a longtime anti-war activist. He'd been an organizer for SDS, Students for Democratic Society. He grew up in DC uh, because his father was an economist with the Truman administration. And uh, Rennie had been to Hanoi. He saw the damage from the American bombs and he decided to devote his life to stopping the war. And he and others felt that 
the tactics that the movement had used up to then had had to escalate from merely marching along the streets to, to more. So he went around to campuses around the country starting in the fall of 1970 to talk up this idea of massive civil disobedience in DC. And Rennie hooked up with David Dellinger, who was a longtime leader in the peace movement. They bonded because they were both members of the Chicago Seven, who were the activists indicted and tried by the government for supposedly inciting the riots that took place in Chicago during the Democratic National Convention in 68. Dellinger was a real apostle of nonviolence, but he also believed it was possible to use force without violence. And to him, a massive act of civil disobedience felt like the right tactic of the moment. This was the slogan of May Day, as I said, if the government won't stop the war, we'll stop the government. Rennie says he came up with it spontaneously during one of his college talks, and it really stuck. One thing that struck me, by the way, during my research was how much of a monumental organizing task this was. You had no email, no smartphones, never mind social media. You had to use a machine called the telephone. You had to mail letters at the post office. You had to use mimeographs, posters, buttons, newspaper ads, word of mouth. And still you could get tens of thousands of people to show up in one place at one time. You know, it's, it's amazing really, the power of a button that says, we'll stop the government. And here's the government. The White House was really worried about May Day. At the same time though, Nixon and his men were actually hoping for some violence so they could blame it on the protesters and win back public approval. Again, sound familiar? Nixon wanted to buy time to carry out his strategy in Vietnam, which was to slowly withdraw troops and preserve the US backed government long enough in South Vietnam for him to win re-election in 72. Um, and the anti-war movement was really a political threat to that plan. Here's Nixon with John Ehrlichman standing all the way on the left next to Henry Kissinger. Ehrlichman is the domestic policy advisor, Kissinger the foreign policy advisor, and seated with his crew cut back to us is uh, chief of staff, H.R. Uh, Bob Haldeman. So in the weeks and days before May Day, Nixon's men held kind of a series of war councils to figure out how to undermine it. And it wasn't just college kids, by the way, coming to town to engage in this civil disobedience. Here's a great shot of some famous leftist academics of the day sitting in the park across from the White House just before the May Day uh, blockade. Some of you might recognize them or, or their names. At the top uh, on the right is Daniel Ellsberg. And Ellsberg came with a secret. He just leaked the Pentagon Papers to the New York Times. To Ellsberg's right is Howard Zinn, later author of The People's History of the United States. And to Ellsberg's left is Noam Chomsky, and all the way on the left, the woman all the way on the left is um, Marilyn Young. These folks formed what the May Day organizers called an affinity group. The idea was that in a massive protest like May Day, you're most effective if you stick with a small group of friends, act together, move together. There were hundreds of such groups forming for May Day. By the weekend, which was the first weekend in May, this is what it looked like above West Potomac Park. The May Day tribe had secured a permit, a federal permit to camp there. Rennie thought, Rennie Davis thought an all night, all day concert would really bring in the crowds and he was right. And by the way, the headliners, believe it or not, were the Beach Boys, go figure. By Saturday, there were nearly 50,000 people in the park and this was really worrisome to the government. So Nixon's war council hatched an idea, revoke the camping permit secretly and then in the, at dawn, send in the riot squad when everyone was all wiped out from the show. The police chief at the time in Washington was Jerry V. Wilson. He was a tall, 6'4 uh, guy from North Carolina. Uh, here he is leading the raid on the park that Sunday morning. And the cops gave everyone until noon to clear out. Now, it must be said, Nick Wilson was not in love with this whole idea. He's also a main character in my book. He was something of a reformer at the time. He'd, he'd been integrating the police, bringing in black and women officers, 
He didn't want a brutal police force like the one in Chicago. And not long before this May Day stuff, he'd actually become the first cop to get the Brotherhood Award from the National Conference of Christians and Jews, in part because he'd handled the previous anti-war demonstrations pretty peacefully. But this was all before the city of Washington could elect its own mayor and city council. So city officials were essentially appointed by the White House. Wilson answered ultimately to Nixon and his men, and he did as he was told. That was his job. A lot of the campers at West Potomac Park wanted to defy the police. They said, we're not going anywhere. So Rennie Davis came rushing over and he went from group to group. You can see him here with the mic, uh, arguing they should leave peacefully and save their energies and their bodies for the next morning for the traffic blockade. Rennie is a charismatic and persuasive guy and he prevailed. But a lot of them were angry and the campers left. Some of them were so angry, they set their makeshift shelters on fire as they cleared out. So this is Sunday, the next day is the blockade. The May Day tribe had planned out this blockade in careful detail. They printed up a tactical manual, 24 pages on newsprint with maps and photos of the traffic circles and the bridges and the intersections that each affinity group was supposed to target, which was great, except that the police also had the manual. So when the morning came, the cops knew where to find the May Day people. The police and, and, and Nixon's men each thought that they'd run most of the protesters out of town with the raid on the park, but that didn't happen because people were, you know, went to other parts of town to sleep and a lot of people were never at the park. They were sleeping in dorm rooms or church basements. So many more showed up on Monday morning than the cops expected. And traffic quickly started getting tied up. The scene is on the Southeast freeway in DC. So the police were soon kind of overwhelmed. They responded with tear gas and the protesters, a lot of them were prepared for that. I mean, look at those gas masks, that's serious stuff. As things got more out of control, the police abandoned all the usual arrest procedures, the kind of procedures that make arrests legal. They were supposed to be filling out paperwork on each bust, writing down the offense, the name of the arresting officer, so the prisoner could be properly charged and arraigned in court. Instead, the police just launched a dragnet. They began sweeping through the streets, arresting anyone who looked like they might be a protester based on how they dressed, the length of their hair, you know, the buttons or the armbands they were wearing. You remember the helicopters landing on the National Mall, right? That happened. And you also had Jeeps driving through Georgetown in a show of force. And you had Marines and soldiers lining the bridges. You can see the rifles and bayonets, I think. And by the way, the rules of the Insurrection Act, which has been talked about recently again, say that before a president calls forth the military in a domestic emergency, a president is supposed to issue a proclamation and an executive order. But the White House ignored that. Nixon's people wanted to keep his role secret. So they spread the news, the fake news, that it was the police who called in the soldiers. There were 7,000 people arrested in the dragnet that day. The police filled the jail cells. These women were relatively lucky. Some cells that were supposed to hold two people were stuffed with a dozen or 20. There wasn't even enough room to sit down, never mind lie down. So they filled the cells then they filled the jail yards and then they had to go looking for another place to stash everyone because they had so many prisoners. What you're looking at here is the football practice field near RFK Stadium, uh, where the police trucked thousands of prisoners behind the chain link fence. They were guarded by the military. I, I still think this is an astonishing sight, you know, mass detention camp in America. It was a cool day for May and the temperatures were dropping. And so the folks at the football field were bust yet again, this time into the Washington Coliseum, still with no access to anyone on the outside. And some of them would be in there for days. But there were still a lot of people left who weren't in jail, May Day people. And the next day, uh, which was a Tuesday, uh, there were enough to fill the streets outside the Justice Department to protest what had happened the day before. 
Another 2,000 people were rounded up outside the Justice Department, another 2,000 people. Here you can see John Mitchell, the Attorney General on the right, still with the pipe, uh, watching with approval from his balcony. So you had these thousands of people locked up. Um, the Justice Department had no intention of letting anyone out to protest again that week. And the prisoners had no access to lawyers or to a, even to a phone call. But there were some lawyers in the city who figured out what was going on. These lawyers were the DC public defenders. DC at the time had the largest public defender service in the country. Um, the story of that is in the book. I think it's really fascinating. The head of it was a woman named Barbara Bowman. You know, women lawyers were fairly rare at the time and women criminal lawyers were even more rare. Um, but Barbara led her lawyers into this thrilling legal battle against the government to get everybody freed. Um, she went on later, many years later, to become a renowned legal scholar at Stanford uh, under her original family name of Barbara Babcock. And it's very sad to report that Barbara died just a couple months ago in California after a long illness. Then Wednesday was the last action of May Day. It took place on the steps of the Capitol. Again, police moved in and arrested another 1,200 people who were doing nothing but listening to some Congress people give speeches. So at the end of this day, it was over. There had been more than 12,000 people arrested, and that remains the largest arrest, mass arrest in American history. At first, you know, the White House seemed to have won. Um, the demonstrations were over, the city was back to normal, the May Day tribe was behind bars. Uh, Nixon invited Jerry Wilson to the White House along with the appointed mayor, Walter Washington. He said, he told them, don't listen to any Monday morning quarterbacks, you guys did a great job. But then the heat started to come in. The courts began weighing in. As I mentioned, the public defenders started winning their cases. I don't wanna spoil the surprise about how this all turned out in the end, you can read it in the book. But suffice it to say, the justice system prevailed, the protesters won, the administration lost. And here's really another big legacy of May Day. Nixon and his men secretly turned that season of dissent, the whole spring offensive, into kind of a lab for all the schemes they would soon direct against their political enemies in the 72 campaign. At the time, this was widely suspected, but it was never proven. And really, it was the first cover up by the Nixon White House. They orchestrated what amounted to an extra constitutional strategy to undermine the protests. They employed illegal wiretaps, they played dirty tricks, they infiltrated the ranks of the protesters, they dodged responsibility for directing the biggest mass arrest in history. And to my mind, this is when they really learned how to ignore the rule of law with impunity. As the book shows, Nixon's May Day mindset led directly to his orders weeks after these protests to undermine the man who leaked the Pentagon Papers, Daniel Ellsberg. Nixon put one of his trusted aides in charge of that operation of undermining Ellsberg. Remember Bud Krogh, the guy who followed Nixon to the Lincoln Memorial? That's the one. And under Krogh's directive, direction, his operatives broke into the office of Dan Ellsberg's psychiatrist looking for damning things about Ellsberg. And of course, some of these same operatives later broke into the Watergate, and we know how that all turned out. I'll close with this slide. This is one of the buses full of the May Day prisoners. You know, trying to imagine an alternate version of history is kind of a fool's errand, a mug's game, as they used to say, but let's play it for a minute. Let's, let's just stop and think that it's possible. Let's imagine a different America now, one in which the Vietnam War ended much sooner, one in which Americans and their leaders then summon the will and the resources and the energy to grapple with the true <laughs> urgent business of government, lifting up the poor, preserving good middle-class jobs, healing the legacy of racism, an America where the divisions didn't get written into stone like they were back then, lasting for generations, leaving us open to manipulation and despair. You know, an America where the constitutional right of dissent turned out to be our saving grace. <laughs>
thank you all for showing up today and listening. I'd be thrilled to hear some questions. Thank you, Larry. That was really great and very fascinating. And um, there's some questions in the chat. There's some questions in the Q&A. And um, after, we, after we get through the questions, if anybody would like to, since you're all muted, if, if somebody would like to share something, I can unmute you for that. Um, so the questions that we have in the Q&A is, um, why did you write this book? Wants to know. Uh, I think I uh, touched on this a little bit earlier. I, I felt that um, <clears throat> the story of the Vietnam War movement was uh, one that needed retelling because I think it faded into memory and people uh, weren't aware of just how powerful a movement it was and uh, how much the, um, you know, a massive amount of dissent can really, uh, you know, change things in this country. I think there are a lot of people here who were present there and they'll support you in that. Farley Green is asking that you interviewed a great mix of people for your book. Did anybody turn you down when you asked for an interview? Uh, yes, quite a few people chose not to be interviewed. Um, uh, some of the people in the uh, Weather Underground chose not to be interviewed. Um, there were some other uh, officials who were still around from the Nixon uh, uh, period who didn't want to be interviewed. So I talked to probably uh, 50 or 60 people in the end. And uh, you know, there were a few more I wish that I'd been able to reach, but um, I felt like I got a pretty good uh, view of all different sides. Um, another question from Farley. Uh, what lessons might today's activists learn from your book? And, and what might those who would want to control or suppress the protests, what, what would they learn? Well, taking the last one uh, first, I mean, I think that uh, those who want to suppress um, protests sometimes end up exposing themselves, their worst side of their character. I mean, in Nixon's case, um, it was, you know, Nixon was a, a very different person than Donald Trump, of course. He was a learned man, he was a lawyer, he loved to read history. Um, he, he, he had a, a, you know, a, a worldview that was very sophisticated. But um, I would argue that Nixon's insecurity and his paranoia and his dark side um, were what ultimately brought him down and faced with the challenge of a social movement, um, that brought out his his worst side. Had he, had he been able to uh, deal with those <clears throat> protests in a more uh, rational way, he might have accomplished his goals in the end without getting uh, uh, involved in cover-ups and unconstitutional activities. Um, what was the biggest obstacle in getting cooperation from Bud Crow and Jerry Wilson? That's Tim who's asking that question. Um, Jerry Wilson, who is still around, um, uh, was very willing to talk about those days. I mean, he felt uh, as well that this was a major uh, event in history that had not been uh, adequately looked at again. Uh, and he was a, you know, he's a fascinating guy. He was a, um, you know, he had, barely a high school education when he joined the force, but he was very intelligent. He was way ahead of his time in terms of police reform. Um, uh, you know, I would say decades ahead. Uh, and uh, a man of integrity who was kind of caught between uh, a very sort of paranoid boss and uh, his desire to, um, you know, not violate any of the norms and his belief that people who wanted to exercise their First Amendment rights had every right to do that, you know, as long as they didn't break the law. And uh, um, he just sort of got himself into a situation where it was, he wasn't going to win either way he moved. And uh, Bud Krogh, um, uh, who died uh, a few months ago, um, he was very ill uh, most of the time that I was working on this book. 
but his family, particularly his son, um, was a great intermediary for me in carrying questions and answers back and forth. And uh, that was really helpful to enhancing the book. So we have, as well as I said, that we have a lot of people who were present there. We have David uh, Iannucci, who was arrested, and he and his friends threw some food to the people who were, um, you know, arrested, and they were in turn arrested. Um, there's another question asking about, did you, from Nicholas Brown, did you have any trouble accessing classified government records? Well, the classified records are classified, you know, you can't get them, obviously, but there were a lot of uh, unclassified records about, you know, documents about May Day, um, primarily a lot of them in the Nixon, you know, administration files at the Nixon Library in Yorba Linda, California, um, and other administration officials had their personal papers at Stanford and some other places. Um, you know, I think I mentioned in, in the book that, uh, and this is my first book, um, I was kind of astonished at how, what an amazing resource we have in this country of these archives and museums who preserve these documents and this data um, in a way that makes it possible to recreate history. And um, I think we sometimes don't realize that buried in these archives in all these different places, you have people who are tending to these boxes of documents, these folders of documents that carry some amazing stories. And um, that was uh, a great resource for me. Thank you. Um, did you interview Re Rennie Davis? I did interview Rennie Davis. Um, he, he has a house up in the hills in uh, Colorado. Um, he's still a very charismatic guy, just like he was back then. And um, uh, he was, uh, it was, it was great to have a chance to talk with him and relive those days. Okay, and I think Jack Mallory is somebody who is, was your source, would like to share something. And I'll uh, get to him after I've answered a couple more questions because there are a lot of questions here. Um, there's a rather long one, uh, but that asks, what did you think of uh, Ken Bourne's treatment of Mayday? He, the, the question is relating to the fact that this anti-war movement has faded away and it has not got its, um, its place in the sun, either through President Obama, Elizabeth Warren. Nobody has included uh, that in the list of honored social exchange movements, you know, so it's kind of faded away. Yes, I think that's exactly right. And that was part of my point that um, uh, particularly the, the May Day um, part of it, but really all of it, I think, has been underappreciated in many. There are some great books uh, that, that, uh, that get into the uh, history and the power of that movement. Um, uh, there's a great book called The War Within by Tom Wells, which is, um, traces the movement from its start till its end. And he talked to hundreds of people. But outside of that, and uh, you know, it's, it's been sort of, uh, it, the question of whether the movements stop the war or not is the only thing that, um, uh, that people tend to think about. So since the war wasn't ended, uh, you know, until uh, later in the Nixon administration, people tend to discount the movement, even though really it was the most successful anti-war movement in really world history in that it brought millions of people into the streets. It forced Lyndon Johnson from the White House there's no question that the movement restrained, um, you know, the American military from doing uh, worse damage. You know, there were a lot of proposals for uh, more bombing, more use of chemicals uh, than even were done. Um, and uh, I think it also set the stage for the ultimate diplomatic solution to the war. And um, uh, but aside from that, I think just the pure organizing brilliance of it and the fact that it could motivate so many people to put their bodies on the line again and again and again uh, is something very, very unique that needs to be celebrated. Uh, there are a lot of questions about your sources. <laughs> they want to know about how you found, uh, uh, they want to know more about the Nixon tapes you found in the archive. And uh, did you find any records uh, from the CIA? Uh, there were, there were records from, 
the, some of the CIA records have been declassified, declassified um, about the surveillance of the anti-war movement. Um, uh, yes, and that's also true of some of the FBI <clears throat> and Justice Department records. In terms of the Nixon tapes, you know, there were thousands and thousands of hours of Nixon tapes and not, still not all of them have been transcribed or listened to just because there's so many. Um, there are some great resources. Uh, you know, one is that the um, Nixon Library itself, which is part of the National Archives, has done a tremendous job in, um, you know, indexing the tapes and, um, you know, giving <laughs> scholars and journalists ways to find what they need to find. There's also a great website that's maintained by uh, a, Tex a Texas professor called nixontapes.org, which has put virtually all the tapes now online. This didn't exist when I started this research. And at the National Archives, um, the tapes are still sitting on cassettes in these file drawers. Um, you can take the cassette out, you know, stick it in one of their players and put the headphones on your head and sit there listening for hours. Now, the quality of the recording of these tapes is really the biggest challenge because it's really hard to make out some of what people are saying. You have to listen to it multiple times. And it took me a long time in listening to these tapes to be able to recognize the voices, like who is talking. Um, because when you do it for the first, you know, 50 hours, you know, who was that? And you have to go keep going back and back to figure it out. But um, as I mentioned in the book, some of, there was a, there was a lawsuit, several lawsuits filed after May Day to recover damages for people whose civil rights were so liberties were violated. And the lawsuits were almost all successful. Um, one of the suits um, subpoenaed uh, the Nixon tape conversations related to May Day. And so the judge granted that subpoena and the order went out to the National Archives to find those tapes. But, and they started transcribing them. Uh, but then the legal case went on and on and on and finally was, uh, decided in favor of the protesters and it was the end of the legal case and it was done. These protesters won, but nobody told the National Archives. So they just kept working on these uh, mm -hmm. tape transcriptions for years. And when they were done, mm -hmm. nobody came and asked for them. So, uh, <laughs> you know, until, until mm -hmm. I went out there. So um, that was a great discovery. Uh, there's a question from Pamela. She was asking you about uh, whether you mentioned the role of the People's Coalition for Peace and Justice. In yes. The book. Yes, the People's Coalition for Peace and Justice was uh, definitely one of the main coalitions involved in the Spring Offensive. There were there were several of those. There was the National Peace Action Committee, People's Coalition for Peace and Justice, which was, um, I think. I think it's fair to say May Day was sort of an offshoot of the People's Coalition for Peace and Justice, but there was a lot of um, uh, correlation between the people who were in one and, and the other. And um, uh, we are, Tevin was wondering, um, how, how have the protesters been caricatured rather than forgotten by politicians? And to what political ends you did address that uh, earlier. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and unmute, I think, uh, James Mallory. Uh, Jack Mallory. And I think Arlene Cohen would like to say something. So I'm going to try and find them. <laughs> um, I think it's alphabetical. Jack Mallory uh, was a uh, member of the Vietnam Veterans Against the War. Okay, so, so Jack, uh, you, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. And I believe you had a comment you wanted to share. Yes, um, Larry, good to see you. Uh, the epigraph to Larry's book is a quote from Judge Harold Green, who was a DC court judge who was in charge of a lot of the prosecutions or the failed prosecutions of the protesters. The epigraph reads, whenever American institutions have provided an hysterical response to an emergency situation, 
we have come later to regret it. I read the book in the context of the George Floyd murder and subsequent protests. And of course, this quote rang in my ears, the entire reading of the book and much of the rest of the book in a very eerie way corresponds to what we've seen in the last several months, particularly in the use of response to social unrest by politicians to their own ends, to further their own political ends, and in doing so, violating constitutional rights. And the book is not just about then. The book is very, very much about now. And I greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much. I think we have a, a last question from Doug. Uh, he is asking, can you talk about the People's Peace Treaty? Do you think it played a role in moving the negotiations in Paris and ending the war? Mm. <laughs> uh, the People's Peace Treaty was a uh, document that was negotiated between the National Student Association here and uh, a bunch of organizations in the South Vietnam, North Vietnam, um, student organizations and others. Um, and it was, it was basically a negotiated settlement to the war, um, dealing with prisoners of war and everything else, but basically saying that the people of Vietnam and the people of the United States don't want to fight each other anymore. And one of the things during the um, spring offensive that happened was that uh, that that document was sort of brought to the steps of the Capitol, and uh, the the protesters were demanding that Congress consider it, that Congress you know vote on it or ratify it. Um, what I found interesting was, and I don't know that that document in itself, uh, you know, influenced the mm -hmm. Nixon administration and Henry Kissinger's negotiate secret negotiations with the mm -hmm. North Vietnamese that ultimately ended up in a truce uh, in a peace deal. But I think it's notable that the actual terms of the peace agreement between North Vietnam and the United States were less favorable than the People's Peace Treaty. In other words, if the, you know, if the American government had adopted the People's Peace Treaty, it, it would have been less, uh, yeah. uh, less of a, uh, almost a surrender um, than it turned out to be, because really it was, for all intents and purposes, a surrender, uh, you know, an acknowledgement that we had lost the war. Great. Um, so we'll just quickly go ahead and uh, there are a couple of uh, people who would like to talk. Arlene, would you like to talk? Hi. Yes, actually it's Leonard who is here and he was at the uh, May Day, and he wanted to speak. A few things. Uh, I'm Leonard Cohen. I was involved in the events of May Day as part of something called the Alternative Media Co-op. I was a photographer and assigned to the 14th Street Bridge. A ragtag group of National Guard was gathering and marching in from Virginia. I shot two full rolls of Tri-X, which was then a popular high-speed black and white film. And then I saw uh, a cop arresting uh, demonstrators there, just hurling them onto a bus. And the next thing I see in my view front is the cop coming towards me. And I'm shooting away rapidly. And the cop grabs my camera and tells me if I don't open it up to spoil the film, he'll smash it. So I opened it up and he exposed the film and threw me on the bus. But I still had two rolls of film in my pocket, which I still have. Um, next thing is uh, John Kerry. I remember John Kerry. He was a hero of ours. And the whole story, which the forces against him later denied, uh, where he was a, uh, you know, that boat thing. I forgot the incident, but the boat, that was true. And the right wing later tried to smash that thing. Um, it's interesting that the that when Kerry when John Kerry finally did run for president, um, the the fast boat, the, sw the swift boat you're talking about, yeah, you know, 
uh, when, when, he ran for, when he finally ran for president, the actual medal tossing ceremony that I mentioned yeah. in the book uh, became one of the issues because the, uh, the, the, the groups that were attacking him were claiming that he never threw any of his own medals over the fence, which was not true. He did throw some of his own uh, medals and ribbons over the fence. But that whole issue became uh, um, you know, revived in that way uh, during the Kerry campaign. Right. One more thing. Uh, Trump, who's like a dumb Nixon, heard about 12,000 arrests on May Day, and he's going to say, oh, I'm going to have 12 million arrests. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the biggest guy. 12 million arrests, because I want to be like Putin. <laughs> That's all. Thank you. Thank you for Thank your you. comments. Um, I think we have Tim who would like to say something. There we go. Um, one of the things that uh, I find interesting in the book was this story on John O'Connor. I think John O'Connor's whole uh, his, his whole operation there was one of the slickest intelligence operations that the police ever uh, mounted against the anti-war movement. And, you know, he ended up being our friend. Um, strange dichotomy. Would you care to offer some thoughts on that? Yeah, for those who haven't read the book, um, uh, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to add a spoiler to it, but uh, inside the Vietnam Veterans Against the War, uh, there was uh, somebody who was very close to the leadership who was actually an undercover agent um, uh, for the police and um, managed to operate without ever being found out until he basically outed himself much later uh, to some of those uh, some of those people he'd been working with all that time and. Uh, remains friends to this day. Thank you. That's an interesting kind of a tidbit <laughs> right there. Um, and we have uh, John McC McAuliffe who would like to say something and... Great. Thank you very much. Um, I was arrested the first morning and I was just thinking the slogan was if the government won't stop the war, we'll stop the government. And obviously we failed to stop the government, but people drew a conclusion from that. They went back home and they organized to infiltrate the government. They wound up organizing with the, people, with, uh, the Indochina peace campaign, with the Quakers, with the coalition to stop funding the war, to press Congress to end funding for the Tio regime. And it was that ending of funding, first stopping the bombing and then the ending of funding that contributed to the ending of the war when it ended. So it's, I don't know, Larry, whether you deal with that postscript in a sense, but a lot of the people who were involved in the spring in various ways continued to be active in a different form. And I think ultimately won. I think that's I think that's a fair reading of the facts. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Um, and the last person that we have is Carol. Carol, would you like to say something? Um, yes, I I wanted to say a couple of things about when I was arrested the morning of May fifth with Ron Dellums and uh, Bella Abzug and some other Congress people. And the, the, the cop, actually it wasn't the cops, they would have known better. But some of the people that came up hit Ron Dellums on the head and the rest of, tried to arrest him until they were informed that he was a Congress person. And, um, and I just wanna talk about the role of the Quakers because they were amazing. Um, they did, training, nonviolent training 
for people at home at their at where they were from. They did it there in Washington. They went around to the various groups and did the nonviolent training. They were amazing. And I think that um, Dave and Rennie were, and the rest of the leadership of May Day and PCPJ were very wise to have used the Quakers in that way. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Well, and thank you, Larry, so much for sharing this evening and that wonderful presentation with us. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, I will have a recording available uh, of this presentation. And um, I can send out, it'll be up on our website in a few days. And uh, I can also send out a link. Thank Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rohini. It was, it was really fun. I really appreciate the, uh, being uh, hosted by you folks. Thank you. And there's a link to the survey in the chat. If you would fill that out, I'd appreciate that from every person who attended today. Thank you. Good night. Good night.